six, I believe. So we have Courtney Adams, Bergenthal, Ramsey, Kwok, and Roden. So um, not to put you on the spot, Darren. Right. Can you chair? <laughs> right, sure. I can. So it is 531. We have a quorum. Uh, welcome, everybody. Um, I guess the first item on the agenda is the approval of the minutes. Uh, did everybody receive a copy of the minutes and or have a chance to review um, with any edits or changes to the October 18th meeting minutes? Motion to approve the minutes. Okay, we have a motion by Sam to approve. Do we have a second? Second. Rob with the second. All in favor of approving, nod or say aye. 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 Okay, uh, meeting minutes are approved. Um, so the agenda item looks like we have two agenda items. Number one, uh, Update on the Community Development Block Grant, the CDBG Disaster Recovery um, Round 2. So uh, would that be you, Abby? Yes. Yep. At the last meeting, um, I delivered the bad news uh, about Round 1 of funding. And at that point, we didn't really anticipate applying for funds for Round 2. Um, however, we have at least one developer that is very interested and has done a lot of work to try to get uh, their project to a point where it could maybe be considered um, shovel ready. Uh, this developer has also done a substantial amount of outreach to all of the elected officials in the city, as well as city staff um, many, many times. <laughs> And um, so we took, we put this on the agenda at the last, it, it actually was not even a regularly scheduled council meeting. It was the special council meeting that we were calling on November 3rd to discuss the budget. And during that meeting, um, no, one, no elected officials stepped up to kind of take the lead on recommending that we proceed with the grant application. I think there, are still a lot of concerns about what happened with round one, but there's also a lot of concern over wanting to direct more resources toward home ownership if we have opportunities. And so during that meeting, um, no one really kind of took the lead on it and there was no action that was taken to move forward with an application. Um, however, there is, there are now two city council members who have sponsored putting it back on an agenda for a consider another consideration. So it's going to city council tomorrow night. And um, I did reach out to the Department of Administration staff and I asked if we would even be competitive because we have not done the competitive process. So how can, you know, we're in the same boat we were the first time where we don't have time to go through the competitive process and select projects. So we're applying for funds with a project to be named. And um, she, the, the staff member that I was coordinating with didn't think we would be compet competitive um, because they think that they're gonna get a lot more applications this round. Um, but still, um, you know, the developer is very interested in trying to give it a go. And so we're waiting until after the council meeting tomorrow night to find out if the council's supportive. And if they are, we do have time um, to put together an application and kind of give it our, our best with the deadline being the 19th, so this Friday. Um, but we are gonna be requesting some funding within that application to administer the grant because we don't think that we have the staff capabilities with other juggling so many other projects to do all the compliance reporting. So we're gonna try to include a line item to hire that out if we are able to secure the funding. And that's about all I have on that, but I'm happy to answer any questions. Um, Alderwoman Susan West has her hand raised. Yes. Uh... 
the project is going to be in my district and I've got to admit, I'm quite pleased with it, with where it will go. And as I've learned more about it in terms of income levels for people, I think it would be a good project for there. I will say I was not as enthusiastic at council because I wasn't sure about could staff manage all the paperwork and so on of administering the grant. But since they've come up with a suggestion for it, I would very definitely be interested in supporting it. Yeah, and so to get down to the specific project um, and the developer that I mentioned who's interested in applying, and this is, you know, Rob Bergenthal is on the board for um, MDC. He's disclosed that in the past and there, there will be no action taken tonight. So I don't see any harm in um, having a discussion of this, but um, it's Madison Development Corporation um, who would be an, at least one interested applicant uh, for the funds if we were able to secure them. And they are a nonprofit housing developer. They have a great reputation. They already have um, one project in Middleton that they own. And they also have been involved in one other project, the Kestrel, and are potentially gonna be assisting with the Trotta on Parmenter Street. Um, and the property that they're looking at is on Century Avenue. I think it's directly adjacent to the Sick Temple. And it's also- uh, Abby, it's adjacent to Pick and Say. Yes. Brookdale, say would be a Brookdale better... is the other side. Okay, so the Brookdale um, Assisted Living to the West, Guard Park Condominiums to the North, and the Pick and Save Supplemental Parking Lot just directly to the East, and then the Pick and Save Grocery Store. So it's a great location for affordable housing, close to lots of jobs. Um, it is also on Century Avenue, which is now the, the one of the two uh, primary corridors that's being considered for bus rapid transit. Um, I can also see another potential benefit in the, the development, which is that Middleton Hills is a wonderful, wonderful neighborhood. But one thing that it lacks is affordable housing. And so this would provide some affordable housing near Middleton Hills. Abby, Su um, Susan was, oh, go ahead. Susan, um, just refresh my memory because I'm, I'm trying, I, I have the general idea. What, what is on the property now? Is it vacant or are there a couple single family homes? What's on there now? Two single family homes, one of which looks like it should be raised. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and this was kind of, you know, I had brought this up. There, there are a number of homes on Century Avenue that are in um, pretty, pretty poor shape. And yeah, that area is certainly uh, one of the areas that I was thinking of as well. So yeah, thank you for pointing that out. I would just to confirm understand. So you're we'd submit for for round two, uh, get get the get the funding for that, and then we'd open it up for um, for proposals. Is that right? Yep, that's correct. And I I think that it would be it could be beneficial, given that we're already we're applying without a project in mind, which I think puts us at a pretty strong disadvantage, especially in the second round because they have many more applicants. So I think that we should try to release the RFP as quickly as we can following the council action. And then we would need to call a special meeting of the, um, of the workforce housing committee together to review the proposals that we receive. The reason that I think it might be beneficial, and I know that the applicant or the person who is really driving this is Lori Heineman with MDC who wants to apply. She, um, I think she would like for us to release the grant, the RFP in early December based on an email I got from her. But I really think if there is a way, and I know with Thanksgiving, it's gonna make it really hard for people to um, respond and we wanna give people plenty of time, but I, I just feel like 
there's going to be a point where the DOA staff is reviewing their applications that they've received and they might be reaching out with you know, questions to the communities. And I would love to be able to say, at least we have released the RFP, even if we haven't been able to make a selection yet, just to show them that we're making progress. Because they're expected to make the awards in mid-December. So it's a pretty quick, I think it's December 17th that they're making their selections. So that doesn't, it's just not a whole lot of time. Um, and it just seems like, you know, depending on the level, the number of applicants that they get, we're going to have a really hard time competing on this, this round. Abby, in this round, is it a total of $3 million? No, they have the 3 million that we had to um, turn back. And then they have another almost uh, 7 million that was not allocated the first round. So it's about 10 million. And they are trying to focus on Dane County. Uh, Dane and Vernon counties are the two focus areas. So they, there's grant money possibly for multiple projects is what you're saying then? Yes, for sure. I do know that the county was having, they were really encouraging communities to apply and they did a really nice job getting the word out to other communities in Dane County. So I think there will be a lot, a lot of more applications. Have you heard of any interest in your talks with other planners in the communities? Um, I don't know of anything specifically. I know that the village of Oregon was, I talked with my counterpart there in the first round, and they were thinking of applying for funds to support a Habitat for Humanity development that they were working on. And I was really interested in learning more about that because I think that's something that our city and council would be really interested in because it's owner occupied. Um, but they weren't able to get their application together in the first round. So I wouldn't be surprised to see an application from them in the second round, but they already had land that they'd secured. They'd already laid out a plan. I think they'd already subdivided the lots. So they were pretty far along on their project. Abby, I would add on this project, something that I think would be of interest to council is this particular project is not within a TIF district. So the value of the property would go immediately onto the tax rolls. And this would, uh, would actually be, yeah. development would be tax exempt because it's oh, okay. a profit, it would but uh, MDC has at least verbally agreed to pay a payment in lieu of taxes. Okay. And really, I, I, you know, I was talking to Mike Slavish about this on the phone the other day, and I said, I feel like I as staff have taken this about as far as I can. And I didn't, I didn't hear any real support at the last council meeting. And so I'm just kind of waiting to get direction from the council, but I'm not spending time revising the RFP at this point. I'm not going to put any more work into it because I hadn't heard any support. And I also was real reluctant um, during the last council meeting. I you know, I think we had already, as staff, agreed not to go after this second round of funds um, because we were just concerned about the administration and some of the, and also the, the um, experience that we had with the first round. And so I wasn't really pushing for it. It was on the agenda because the developer had requested that it be on there. Um, and I certainly don't want it to appear that I'm, I'm the staff person that's really pushing this because I think I've kind of taken this as far as I can and I'm just waiting to hear from the council and I'll take my direction from them as to whether they want me to spend the time applying.
Okay, any other discussion or comments? Is there any action that the committee needs to take? No, for informational purposes. This is just an update. Got it. Okay, shall we move on to the second agenda item? The uh, strategic plan consideration of affordable home ownership. Yeah, and I have um, just one quick update and then I think we can discuss the document that Sam put together that I included in your packet um, based on the discussion that we had at the last meeting. I had a meeting um, last week with Olivia Williams, who is the executive director of the um, Madison Area Community Land Trust. And she also included Jocelyn Borchart in the meeting and Jocelyn is with Front Porch Development. She has a small consulting firm. She used to work for JT Klein, so that's her experience um, in the development community. And we were talking about, you know, the possibility of acquiring that lot on Century Avenue where the home was recently torn down and whether that might be a good site for some owner-occupied affordable housing. And Madison Area Community Land Trust will be very interested in a project. They think that they could potentially put four units total on that lot. And uh, it would be long-term affordable because they, they own the land long-term and they take the, they remove the cost of the land from the amount that the applicant has to borrow for. So they would only be borrowing for the improvements on the land, but they also have an income restriction and an affordability restriction on their units. Um, they would need assistance not only with the land, which kind of was my previous impression. I was like, if they got donated land, they would be able to construct the units and make them affordable and, and handle all, all of that. But they said that they would also need assistance with the improvements because the cost of construction is about $250 per square foot. So even a 1,000 square foot unit is 250,000 and that does not include any architecture or engineering um, costs. And so in order to make them affordable, especially in Middleton, um, they would need uh, some additional assistance. What I learned during that meeting is that the county is getting $50 million in ARPA funding to support affordable housing. That number really surprised me. Wow. Um, <laughs> yeah, $50 million. And Jocelyn has been working with Olivia Perry at the county who leads up, she's in their planning and community development department, and she leads up the Dane County Housing Initiative, which Mike has been really heavily involved with. Um, the entity that is administering the funds is the, I think they're called, I'm gonna forget the name, but it's the department that Casey Becker leads at the county. I think it's health and community resources, or I can't remember the name of it, but um, Olivia suggested that we meet with Casey Becker and start kind of scribbling out how a project could maybe work with them for affordable owner-occupied housing. And so we've asked Olivia to try to set up a meeting on that and figure out the next steps. Um, so that's one, one idea. It would be a small project, just probably just four units. But nevertheless, a start. Yes. And so now I'm gonna pull up the document um, that was included in your packet called Workforce Housing Process Idea. And I'll turn it over to Sam, if it's okay with you, Sam. Sure, yeah, I just uh, put this in place based on the, or just kind of drew it up based on the discussion that we had with uh, Mike Davis, Abby in the committee last time. And uh, what Mike had expressed is that there's basically a shortage of developable, developable land in the city of Middleton for workforce housing. But we had also talked about the fact that um, opportunities do come up 
here and there and that there might be some money flowing in. I think this is, this is definitely before we knew about this $50 million uh, commitment. Um, but we kind of talked about, you know, that these opportunities would be um, not uniform and would just come up here and there and that perhaps we should just be prepared given the need and the lack of available land. So, um, you know, if, if one of these houses is destroyed by a tree or if there's a bankruptcy or someone decides to donate or something like that, can we be prepared with, uh, first with some money somehow? Um, and so that would be a big one. And I, I actually have no idea if we, if we, if we are able to access um, or if we do have capital to acquire um, properties, even at if they're offered at uh, less than market rates. And then the next thing would be just an evaluation criteria that we could put together so we could easily uh, determine if these opportunities are something we should explore. Uh, and then of course, just you know, using the term deer, deal flow, just determining if there's a way that we can um, you know, put the word out that city of Middleton is looking for properties like this. And then I think just developing partnerships in the community. I, I put this kind of just the Geno's thing being closed on Sundays, just as an example in, in my daily life of just running into workforce issues. Uh, I went to the, the pizza place uh, where they're known for other things at Villa Dolce last week, they're closed at lunch now. So it seems like something that is, you know, the lack of workers, lack of workforce housing is something that's going to be impacting our community over the long term. So it should be something to motivate people to get involved and try to solve the problem. So those are just kind of the four things that I scratched together uh, based on the conversation uh, with Mike. And I guess that's all I would have on it. And just, I'm pretty naive on this because I'm new to the committee and I've never worked in real estate. So I just kind of scratched it down and wanted to get folks thoughts on it. We can open it up to the committee for discussion, but I just wanted to mention one other potential partner in this, and that's the Chamber of Commerce, um, because Kate Miller at the Chamber told me that most of their time right now is being spent with their um, Chamber businesses on employ, you know, lack of employment or lack of employee issues, so labor shortage issues and um, they have a special committee that's working on it, so they might be willing to help support this initiative as well. I have a question, and I, I don't know if you know the answer, Sam, or maybe have your mic. But how would we be able to compete, with, you know, with the with the private market for for real estate property? Let, let's say something burns down or is ripped down, like the case, you know, across from 1847. There, how would we be able to compete with with, with private markets of, of private land. Um, are, are there strategies that, that we could employ to be able to, to do that? Now, certainly that, that the home that was raised across from 1847, there's complexities there, right? So I don't know what the bank was, is needing on that 200 or 300,000 and nobody's gonna pay that and put a single family home there. So obviously there's an opportunity for some creative financing and, and you know approaches there, but what about you know more or less like a standard residential property? Um, how 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 would how could we compete? I guess is my question. And I don't I don't think we have to get all the answers here, but it's just something that I, I don't know the answer to that. That's an excellent there's, question, there, and I think the the best way that we could compete would just be by getting the word out that we would like to have an opportunity on, on properties that uh, folks have given up on or um, would like to donate. Okay, so, so property, you, you know, 
not necessarily every vacant or every fire or whatnot. I mean, if there's an opportunity to put a, you know, a new single family home and the, and the market bears that in the bank, you know, whoever's got the note on it can make the, you know, somebody's going to pay fair market value for it and build a new home. Um, but maybe it's, it's, it's getting our ducks in a row for these other oddball cases, for instance, across from 1847, where somebody's not going to pay that and, and, and rebuild a single family home there. So that lot is going to probably sit there until the bank makes a move on it or somebody like us, if, if we were, you know, had a plan, we could, we could start to maybe collaborate with some different partners on that property. You know, I do think that this is the more labor intensive way to go, but if we could create a mechanism with the banks by which they could bring to our attention properties that would go for auction, that, that might be a way to, uh, uh, to ensure that the, that property becomes affordable. I think the biggest way to do it would be de developer building condos but we haven't seen that in the marketplace, except for recently Bell Farms, uh, the developer there would like to build condos. I think she still has it in her plans, right, Abby? 40 condos? It's, it is in the plans, but please note that they have not been built yet. I mean, that is a proposal right now for zoning. And we have um, zero lot line owner occupied townhomes in Conservancy Bend as well, but that project received a TIF subsidy and the developer did try to walk that back after <laughs> um, after proposing it because he was running into problems with financing and getting those constructed. He wanted to convert that to rental housing, but we pushed back on that. Oh, well, that's true. And the cost is running like 450 to 500 for those yeah. townhomes. Yeah, they're closer to 500, Mike. Uh, hey, Mike, so know Mike's to Mike's point about um, working with the banks to get like a list of properties that are going to come uh, up for foreclosure or have reached that point, distressed properties, the banks will, you can get on email lists and get that information. Mm -hmm. There are banks that will, that will give you that information. And you can get like a monthly report. I think that in you know that, that information is all good and, and fine, but I think that what what Sam said with having a mechanism, it's not only having the property, but it's having the mechanism or the partnership or the funds to be able to jump on it quickly. That's where the you know that would probably be the only advantage if there if you were able to move quickly because you had all your ducks in a row that you would have over the private sector. That and perhaps some county ARPA funds for a project of this nature to try to secure single family homes. Well, and that's an, that's an excellent point that we can, you know, we can lobby the county for, for some of that money to go into home ownership opportunities and get them on board in a partnership. It's an expensive but long-term solution, particularly if we can get Habitat for Humanity interested, and I think they would be very interested with available properties in, uh, in Middleton. And I, I, the one thing that I do like about this idea, uh, Sam, and thank you for putting this together, is it, it, at least it starts to educate us on what is out there. You know, what, what are these properties? Uh, can we inventory them? Can we just get a handle on what's out there to identify, you know, what possible opportunities could we create as part of this committee or help facilitate? Um, there's got to be quite a few out there that are not even hitting our radar because we're not familiar with um, with all these pieces of property out in our community. And I don't know how often yeah, they come here. up, but you know, when they do, it'd be good to have them. Darren, I think when, when you had brought up the issue of how do we compete, I, I think it's definitely with funding and with, with partnerships like what, what Abby said with maybe Jocelyn or, or a Habitat that 
that there's developers out there that that know the demand and the need um, and know that there would be some supplemental funding. Um, I think that that would be the best way to get a project going. Yeah. I think some of the um, larger companies in town, um, you know, uh, say for instance, a TDS, um, who have been attempting to um, up their game with diversity and inclusion. And I think a lot of companies are getting some pushback saying, what are you really doing? You know, and what, what can you, what actionable steps can you take to um, improve your community in this way? And um, so I think there's opportunity, there may be opportunities there because of the pushback some companies are getting to be more active and more intentional with their um, policy changes. Oh, and I was also wondering whether um, we think contacting mortgage companies would be at all fruitful um, with finding out, you know, getting heads up on properties that are, um, like we were talking about with the banks. So uh, let me just ask a question here. So Mike and Abby, is this something that, that you feel um, would be a good idea for the committee to start exploring? I guess would, would be one. And then two, would, would it make sense to maybe assign like a little subcommittee to just dig into this a little bit and maybe report back to the larger committee, um, you know, in a month or two months to see what else we can kind of dig up? What, what type of leeway do we have here? In, in terms of a uh, subcommittee, uh, what we've used in the past with other committees is a task force approach, which is a minority of the committee. And so that any items that that task force comes up with come back to the public meeting for discussion and, and uh, eventual um, adoption. So how many do we have in this group? Is it Seven? We have 10. We have 10, oh gosh, I'm out of date. <laughs> so a group of a, as many as four could work as a task force. Yeah, I like the idea. I think a task force is a good idea. I think the hardest part is gonna be identifying a funding source because I think that, I don't think that the count county will just give us money to establish this fund without having it tied to a specific project. I could be wrong about that. We can bring it up in the meeting we have with them. Um, there is one potential funding source that I think would work really well, but it's many years out. And that is using the affordable housing extension at the closure of TIP District 3 where we could take the increment that's remaining and we would have three years to spend it and we could spend it anywhere in the city for affordable housing and it wouldn't just have to be within the TIP district. So that, I mean, we could have three really productive, productive years, but the TIF isn't expected to close until 2030. We may close it early. We might close it in 2027 or 2028. Um, but that's still many years in the future. I think the angle for the county participation would be if the land uh, was donated to the community land trust, the Madison Community Land Trust for affordable housing. And then there's a guarantee that it's going to be affordable for the long term or to Habitat for Humanity. Both of those are long-term solutions for single family housing. Because then, you know, the, the, 
greatest enemy to single family affordable housing is the land values continue to skyrocket and probably will for a very long time. Maybe we could start with, uh, do, you know, does the committee want to endorse this concept and, and get some volunteers for a task force that would meet and, and discuss it? Yeah, I, um, I, I totally think that this would be a great initiative for this committee to take a look at. I mean, yeah, I, I'm totally in favor and I would actually uh, volunteer to be on this uh, task force if, if um, others are. I would volunteer to join the task force too. This is Sam. I would as well, Betsy. I would do it as well, Rob. Sounds like we got a task force. Four people. <laughs> Who's the fourth? I missed that. Was that Rob? Rob. Yeah. It's Darren, Sam, Rob, and Betsy. If I counted right. Great. Is, uh, to Betsy's point earlier, does, does anyone have a contact with a uh, uh, mortgage finance company? Rob, I'm thinking you probably do, but you know, I could I could try to chase it down, but I think it was Citigroup. I, I, it's it's not local, but I can figure out how to contact the servicer. Yeah, for sure, I can do that. I also got a call from the broker that represents Habitat. And I know you probably have gotten from David Baer, calls from him all the time. Mm -hmm. Trying really hard to find something in, in Middleton. Um, it, it might not hurt to, to chat with them again. That's a good idea. Um, I do have a contact at a mortgage company. I got to look up the name of it. Um, but yeah, I might have something there. And I guess um, on a task force, I feel like um, I don't have a problem going to different businesses and um, trying to work up partnerships and doing research, but I don't know a whole lot about um, the whole financing thing. Yeah, I think I, I think we'd probably take you know the first couple of meetings just to kind of gather our thoughts and organize a little bit and see who's you know what strengths lie where, and then maybe develop a little uh, action plan to, to bring back to this committee and and then maybe attempt to make some progress. How 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 much work would um, this task force be asked to do before we would like report back to to this committee? I guess what what would seem reasonable? About we set a timeline on that. You know, give give yourselves um, till uh, mid January to come up with a recommendation to the committee, okay. say for the January Workforce Housing Committee. I think that was a good question. What is it that we're um, wanting to come up with, what what would be, I guess we'd have to develop that in the task force. Right. Yeah, I think we need, as Darren said, I think we need a more detailed action plan. This is sort of like a concept document that we have mm -hmm. so far and uh, just need to look into each one of these things and see if it's feasible. And I guess it's a, it would be like a, a feasibility recommendation maybe. Sounds good. Yeah, so why don't the four of us will get together a couple of times. We'll, we'll come up with a strategy plan to bring back to this group from the January meeting. I, I can offer to uh, uh, facilitate a, a Zoom as well. Awesome, right. thanks. So, 
Go ahead. Go ahead, Abby. Well, I was thinking um, one possible next step would be maybe, and I don't know if this needs to happen before the January, but I'm thinking like of reaching out to a couple people in the area that might have examples of similar things that other communities have done. Um, one is Olivia Perry with the county. She might be a good resource because she kind of pulls together the whole group of people who are working on affordable housing countywide. And that includes like city people as well as real estate developers, nonprofit housing developers, social service people, all kinds of people are involved with that group. But then also, um, I wonder if Kurt Paulson from our plan commission who used to be on the workforce housing committee might have any ideas as well. Yeah, I think along those lines, um, Mark Epley who has up the real estate program at, at UW and no, Kurt, he's pretty dialed in at this and he's really dialed in statewide where they've done some of these as is Tom Landgraf who works there too. Oh, I think yeah. on a, a Zoom call to see if, if this has been done somewhere else and, and where has it been done and how has it worked would be really helpful. I love that idea. So I, I'd be happy to get those guys. Abby, I have a question for potential locations. Does the city have a list of properties that have that we've received calls about the state of the building, such as like the one on Century that we just raised? I certainly know of another one on High Road that the roof's falling in and is similar to that, that those would be potential properties. I'm sure we could um, pull a list from our software that we use for building inspection, but we probably would want to only maybe share that with the working group and not in yes. a meeting that's going on to YouTube. <laughs> right. No, I agree. It shouldn't go public, but there are, I know some houses around that we've had to raise or serious concerns. You know, how the committee or the city gets the land is another issue. Does the city own any land right now that would be suitable? No. No. Not until we decide what happens with the downtown buildings and the community campus. I think Mike mentioned that at the last meeting that there might be some land we could work with that would come out of that plan, but we haven't completed it, so we don't know yet. So just to elaborate on that, what we've been talking about, although it was almost two years ago now, <laughs> uh, since we paused the community campus plan, was a repurposing, not repurposing, but a uh, possible redevelopment of our three buildings downtown, the uh, senior center, city hall and library into one building, thereby freeing up some land for uh, uh, redevelopment possibly condo development. Okay, so um, back, back to this um, white paper that Sam came up. Mike, you, you offered to initiate setting that meeting up or? Sure. Or, no, okay. So then that, that's Darren, Sam, Rob, and Betsy. Yeah, do you all wanna do some research to begin with uh, before we reconvene? Sure. Sure. Maybe just share what, what, all, what you each your interest would be in, in uh, researching and then we set a date in uh, December. So should we send that out to the task force to each other before we meet to, to share some of that? Yeah, don't send it to the whole committee because you're, you know, you, you can't operate as a workforce housing committee because you're a publicly ordained body. So who should we send it to? 
you can send it to me and I'll send it okay. to the four of you. How about that? That sounds good. Sounds like a plan. Well, thank you, Sam, for taking the time to put this together and getting it rolling. It's, it's exciting. I was looking for a chance to give you some more work to do, Darren. Right. <laughs> Just kidding. Oh, it'll, be, it'll be good to work with you all on this. Yeah, I agree. Okay. Darren, you're still on the mom board, right? I am, yeah. So I can, uh, I'll put it on my plate to talk to Ellen. So, so you, you probably all see Ellen more than I see Ellen, so. <laughs> Whatever happened to that building that's right next to mom? It's, you know, that's another interesting building. Um, it's still there, um, he's still entertaining offers. What, what he wanted was nowhere near what mom wanted to pay for us, so. But um, it's it's still there. Well, that might be an opportunity. Uh, that was one going back to when Dietrich Gruen was a director at Mom. Uh, had been talked about as transitional housing for Mom clients. Right. So it is still for sale. I I, I believe informally. I, I don't I don't know if it's actively on the market, but there was discussions with the building owner about. You know, where a, a purchase price or two was thrown out, and this is probably um, is it Tim Tim Carey that was kind of working with Mom and was kind yeah. of involved um, in, in some of those discussions. But that was about three years ago. Yeah. Is Tim still on the board? He he's not, but he's he's a. A lifelong friend of mom, so we get to we get to lean on him when we want. So. Right. Not that it's a uh, it, it all a similar type of property, but it, what about on uh, uh, on Parmenter, the the old Hardee's? Is there any action on that? That that's going to be a gonna tough. Become a Burger King. Is it really? Yeah. 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 Wow. <laughs> City Council has something on the agenda tomorrow night for the Burger King. Hmm. Interesting. <clears throat> okay, anything else tonight? All right. Hearing none. Um, Abby, do you have anything else? Mike? Nope. I don't. Okay. Somebody like to make a motion to adjourn. So moved. Uh, do we have a second? Second. All right. All in favor? Aye. 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 All right. Great to see everybody. And uh, we'll look forward to seeing you next time. Thanks, Darren. Yeah, thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.